Good morning, friends. Uh, so it's good to see you guys. Let's see. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Let's see. I'm, I might see if I can put Ben on the spot here. Let's see. Ben, would you mind grabbing some of those blue Bibles? And if anyone's interested, we just got like a case of them. Finally, we were running low. And uh, so if you want to have one, take it home. It's yours. You can keep it. Uh, and if you want, you can open your Bibles or your apps, right, your phone, whatever you got, uh, to Acts chapter 15. That's where we're going to be today, as well as Romans 14. I know your app probably can't do that, but I'm giving some favor to those who are the old school Bible flippers, right? So you can actually hold two places at once, but we on our apps, we can't. So, uh, so over a year ago, we were actually in uh, a series uh, going through the book of Acts, all right? And then that's one of the things that we do here. Sometimes we go through books of the Bible. Sometimes we teach topics. Uh, we see benefits in both of those things, so we're not like strict adherence to one or the other. Uh, and, and we've been going through the book of Acts, so since then we've, we've looked at some letters that have been written to the churches. Uh, we've done some topical series as well, and we're going to be going back to Acts today, and we're in Acts 15, and in case you've missed previous sermons. Uh, they're all available online, valleytownchurch.com. Uh, you can see kind of what we've preached through. It hasn't just been me. This has even been like our previous pastors, which has been awesome as well. Uh, and also, if, if you you know, don't want to listen to sermons, it's also in your Bible. Like you could just read Acts 1 through 15 right on your own time. It's all there. It's really good. That's what most of the church has done up to this point rather than listening to my sermons. So, uh, so yeah, so in Acts, we've seen a lot of cool stuff happen. Uh, Acts uh, tells the story of the early church, right? The church that Jesus had started, right? That he initiated, he sent out his followers. It, uh, it's a church that's equipped by the Holy Spirit, empowered, right, to go out and, and spread the gospel to all of the world. That's the idea in the book of Acts. So, so throughout this, we've seen different instances where, right, the church has had uh, needs arise within and, and the, the body of believers has have shared resources. We've seen persecution from without the church, right? And yet there's still boldness in the church to go forth and proclaim. We've seen uh, churches planted. We've seen leaders raised up and trained and, right, uh, you know, authority delegated. Uh, we've seen miracles happen in the book of Acts. And, uh, and today we're actually going to look at what you might perceive as, as a problem is that the church encounters disagreement, right? Internal disagreement. And, and the way that we handle disagreement, because it's, it's bound to happen, right, it, it, it matters how we handle it so that we, you know, are Christian in the way that we manage our disagreements so that we don't cause uh, greater rifts or, or despair, right, or, or misrepresent Christ to this world. So in, in Acts 15, it's on page 665 of those blue Bibles, if you're following along, uh, I'm on verse 36, and we're following Paul here, right? He was previously uh, someone who hated Jesus, who hated the church, right? Who was promoting the arrest of believers and even uh, their murder. Uh, and he has since encountered Jesus and has, had, has become like essentially his greatest advocate, right? And uh, so we've seen Paul, he's been planting churches with these other guys kind of throughout uh, the Roman Empire. So verse 36, this is what we see, Right? After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, who was his, his buddy in planting churches, he says, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing, right? So it's demonstrating a care for the churches that they'd started, right? Let's make sure these, these churches are doing okay, right? That's, that's what they wanted. And verse 37, Barnabas agreed and so that, that's good so far, and wanted to take along John Mark. Other translations of the Bible might say John also called Mark, and depending on the passage of Scripture, right, he might be referred to as, as either. Uh, verse 38, here's the problem, but Paul disagreed strongly, all right, since John Mark had des deserted them in Pamphylia uh, and had not continued with them in their work. So Paul doesn't want to take this guy, John Mark, with them. He's like, this guy's not worth our effort or time. I don't know, right? But basically because he had deserted, he, he left their cause back in Acts 13 is where we, you would see that, uh, that he didn't want to take him with him. And yet Barnabas wants to. Verse 39, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Right? This, this might seem like a problem, like, oh man, like, I guess this isn't good, right? The church just fell apart from here and you never heard it, about it again for about 2,000 years, right? No, 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 like, they kept 
They kept going. Something good happened after this, all right? So it's not like, you know, uh, church splits or disagreement amongst believers is something that's only a modern problem, all right? It's something that's been happening since the beginning, right? So we don't have to be discouraged at that, and disagreement is, is bound to happen. It's okay. So let's see. So they, they, they disagreed so sharply that they separated Barnabas had actually taken John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, we'll read about their adventures in Acts 16 later on in this series, and, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to uh, the Lord's gracious care, and then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there, All right? So that's the general idea that we see here, right? We see that uh, there was a disagreement not just like in the church, but these were among the church planters, right? These were among, right, the leaders of the church, right? The, one of these guys was an apostle, right? And that there's this, this sharp disagreement. But the way that that disagreement is handled matters. And although maybe you're not passionate about, right, we won't disagree like, oh, I think John Mark should go on this missions trip, right? Whatever, like, right, we're not passionate. This isn't the thing that we're necessarily disagreeing about nowadays. But when it comes to our more current modern disagreements, we can still take lessons from the Bible, and that's what we'll be looking at in Romans 14 a little bit later, uh, as, as to how we handle those disagreements, all right? How best to handle that? Because the goal is that even where there is a disagreement, there will be eventual uh, reconciliation. And that's the good news I'll, I'll let you know right here is that, uh, that eventually these guys got back together. These guys were working together. They were buddies again, all right? That, that it is conveyed throughout the scriptures that some of the letters that Paul writes, right, he commends both Barnabas and John Mark and desires to work with them further. So, so at some point, there is reconciliation among these guys. But until there's reconciliation, right, until we're like fully agreed and are able to work together, the way we handle disagreement matters. And I want to point out that Christians don't always agree with one another. Uh, I don't think that's like a, a myth that is, needs to be dispelled. Like, I think everyone realizes Christians don't always agree with one another. And there's actually great opportunity for us to have points of disagreement, points of potential contention, right? Uh, times at which it would be very easy to offend one another. Okay, like here, here's just some of the things that I, I thought through, right? Although we're all trying to submit to God's plan for our lives and right yields to where he's leading us, we don't always have that whole picture. That's not all diagrammed out for us, right? We don't exactly know what that's going to be. So, right, if there's multiple people that are like, I think God's leading me this way, I think God's leading me that way, right, there's opportunity for disagreement, Right? Or as far as implementation, right? Of like there's opportunity for disagreement. Uh, sometimes we as believers might have different values on things. Oftentimes that's a result of, right, slightly different interpretation of, of Scripture. And that's okay. The Bible is inerrant, but our interpretations aren't always, right? I, I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, and, and sometimes we're just in different phases of our walk with Jesus. Right? And hopefully, right, I, let, let me tell you this. I don't want a church where all of us in the same room are all in agreement. Right? Like, I don't want to just like preach the Bible where it's like, yep, we already all agree with that. That's great. Because that would mean that we're not growing, right? Or that we're not reaching new people, right? That we're not having an effect in our community. I don't want to just have a club of everyone agreeing together all the time. Right? We want to have people that are at different phases in their walk with the Lord. Right? And I know that when I first right, started following Jesus, that I don't agree with all the things that I believe right now. Right? And I hope that you could say the same thing about yourself, that since you've become a follower of Jesus, you've learned things. Right? I hope like, it wasn't just like day one, like, all right, I'm, I'm done learning. I've got it all figured out. No, like, hopefully you continue to grow in the knowledge of God, right? that you continue to grow in, in his word. Right? And as you continue to learn things, your mind and opinions conform more to his, but during that time period, right, how do we relate to one another as believers, right? Because there's younger believers that maybe aren't as familiar with some of the things that God's conveyed as truth, right? And then even us mature believers or whatever, like, we still don't have it all nailed down, right? We don't have it all 100% figured out, 
So there's going to be areas where we can disagree. And then not only that, but we all still have our sin nature. We're all still emotional, right? Our flesh is not always sufficiently crucified when we gather together, right? That there's things that might, you know, offense can rise up and we might not respond or react in the best way because we still have sin, right? So there's opportunity for believers to be offended. And I'd also point out that I I don't think there's any Christian who's who's not experienced this, where you go through a season of unrepentance for your own sin, right? Where you're still a child of God, you're still forgiven, but where you just kind of like stop obeying God, you stop following God for a season of your life, right? So, I mean, in, in a season like that, there's bound to be disagreement amongst believers, right? So, so that's one of the things that I would, I would point out. And in, in their case, in Acts, it's not necessarily true that either of them were wrong. It's not necessarily true that either of them were right, but what's cool is that God was able to use this separation, this, this disagreement, for his utmost glory. Right at the end of that passage, we saw that churches were still encouraged, right? That these guys were still out planting more churches. And, and I, I know that sometimes we fit it into our, our theology that like, okay, someone can be doing evil or wrong, and God can still use that for good. Like, we figured that out, right? We see that with Joseph in the Old Testament book of Genesis, talking to his brothers. He says, what you have meant for evil, God has used for good, right? So we've, we've kind of like sorted that out theologically. We accept that. But sometimes it's almost as if we don't cut ourselves enough slack that we almost don't believe like that our good intentions, that our good eff- efforts to do what's right in which we fail, we sometimes doubt God's ability to use that for good. But he absolutely can, right? If he can use evil and work it out for the good of the world and for believers, he can certainly use our failed attempts to do good, to bring him the utmost glory, right? So it's not like we have to like be like, well, God doesn't know how to use that part of my life. I messed up there. No, no, no. God is able to do that. In, in my own experience, I grew up in a church, uh, right? And then in my 20s, I was a witness to uh, mismanagement in that church, where there was actually sin in the, in the pulpit, right? They, they sinned from the pulpit. They lied and everything, and, and there ended up being a church split, right? And you would think, like, this is, like, the worst example of Christianity, right, when there's hypocrisy, right? That's a problem. Like, that should irritate us. That's something that God's not pleased with. And God does hold leadership accountable, right, to a greater standard, right? But, but what was interesting was out of this this all of this happening and out of this church split, I have seen three, three new churches get planted by new leaders, right, that were planted in a way that was not done in competition with the original church. It wasn't like they were just out like, I'm going to plant a church out of spite. Like, I'm going to go start my own club. Like, no, no, no. Like, it was actually done in an awesome way, all right, where, where God was actually able to use a bad thing, right, sin in the church leadership to, as a result, scatter Christians and then produce more fruit elsewhere. And, and that's actually a tactic that God's used before. He's used that in the book of Acts, where, right, Jesus tells the church, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and then they're all just like, maybe let's just hang out in Jerusalem for a while, right? Let's just have our own, like, small Christian club. The rest of the world we know doesn't know Jesus. Let's just hide here together. And like, that's kind of what they did for a while. But eventually persecution happened where people outside of the church were like hunting these guys down and it caused the church to scatter. And this this negative experience resulted in God being most glorified because they, they scattered and brought Jesus with them to the world, right? So God's able to use even our failures for his glory. So, so this is the question, what do we as Christians do when we disagree? How do we handle those situations, right? What, how, how do we process through that? And, and that's, that's what we're going to study today. Uh, you can turn to Romans 14 if you'd like. But, uh, but one of the things that we do is we, we disagree agreeably with one another, all right? We, that that we, we treat one another still with love and respect when we disagree, all right? We show priority and care to each other when we disagree, all right, and, and, and Paul talks about some particular instances here, but I just want to point out that Christians, 
we don't all agree 100% on everything, but we should still be in encouraging one another, equipping one another, right? Uh, and in fact, all right, our, our church is, is non-denominational. We don't agree with Baptists 100%, but we love Baptists, right? We love what Baptists do. So even though we don't agree with them 100%, we still send some of our money to Baptist organizations that plant churches because we're passionate about the same thing that they are. And even though we might not agree 100%, that's okay because it's like, you guys go and do the, the work of God, right? We want to see more churches planted in Vermont. So it's not like we need 100% agreement to make that happen, right? In our own local church body here, this room is filled with people who don't agree with each other 100%, and that's okay, right? The, the, the biblical solution for that would not be like, well, I guess we need to like figure out exactly what everyone believes, and then like we'll just split up into a bunch of micro churches where we each can have our own club of, of 100% like-minded people. Like that wouldn't be glorifying to God, right? God is glorified when we can work together even through the areas that we disagree, okay? So, so that's what we should be able to do. So, so this week, what I'm going to focus on is, is when neither party are necessary, necessarily right or wrong, okay? That, that, that it's not a matter of, like, there's sin, all right? It's just a matter of differences of, of opinion, all right? That's, that's what I'm going to be look at, looking at today. And, and there are instances in which the Bible is abundantly clear on things, and in those instances, we submit to, we yield to, we obey Jesus, okay? But there are other areas of the Bible where it's, it's vague or it doesn't address particular issues, right? Or it's a gray area. And it's in those instances where obviously we would have different opinions, different practices, different doctrines, right? And, and that's all right because those practices or doctrines will not be in blatant contradiction to God's gospel, right? To salvation, right? There's a difference between just being like, well, I, I want to practice this way versus like, I don't think Jesus is the only way to heaven, right? That, that's like not a difference between, uh, you know, a disagreement amongst Christians. If, if you don't yet believe Jesus is the way to heaven, you might not actually be a Christian yet. And that's okay. We, we love you. We want you to keep coming here. Right? We want you to seek out Jesus and find out who he is and evaluate whether or not you should believe in him. Right? That, that would be worth experiencing. So in, in terms of just some different Christian practices, I actually looked up uh, some puritanical regulations, right? the Puritans. Right? They, I actually read this story where you weren't allowed to kiss your spouse in public. All right? And there was this captain who like, went on a three-year jour- voyage, I guess it's journeys by land, but uh, he went on a three-year voyage, right? He comes back to town, he runs to his house, he sees his wife on his doorstep, and he kisses her, and then he's thrown in the stocks for a couple hours because of, like, lewd public behavior, right? Like, that's probably not something that, like, we're passionate about as a culture today, right? That would be, like, a different practice, right, where the Bible's not 100% clear on that, right? And, and we would be like, no, I think I'll just disagree with that. Like, I think that's okay to kiss your wife in public. Like, I don't think we need to. And then also we probably, even if we agreed, we probably would disagree with the implementation of how discipline happened in that situation. But, but nonetheless, right, so here some different practices that Christians might disagree on is uh, can Christians dance? Not talking about my ability to dance because I don't have it, but talking about are we allowed to? Is it morally okay? And there's probably like some dances twerking that aren't appropriate for Christians. But, right? Yeah, I've, I'm not going to do any dance moves today. I've, I've got a really tight sermon to, to do. Um, but, uh, man, now you, get, you lost. I'm, mm, mm. I, I know of a church where their youth pastor at his wedding was not allowed to dance with his spouse. Like, they just got married. Like, you're not allowed to dance. Like, that's like a practice where it's like, wow, that seems like a little strict, right? Christians might disagree on that. Like, we, we, you can dance, just so you know, right? We're not, we're not one of those churches. Uh, but, but Christians disagree. Or, or there's matters of practice. Can we eat certain foods? What's allowed? What, what are we allowed to eat? allowed to eat? Can we, should we gather on a Saturday or a Sunday? When should we worship God together? Some Christians might disagree on that. All right. Should we celebrate Old Testament holidays? Right. Should we, should we like go out and do like the things, right? Should we celebrate Passover? Right. Should we do these things? Christians might disagree on that and that's okay. 
right? It's not something that's going to affect their salvation. And, and Paul actually even talks about the fact that we've been freed from, right, the law of the Old Testament. But if some people still like, you know, are excited about some aspects of it, that's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? Uh, so, yeah, what, what Old Testament law do we still have to practice is usually just kind of like the big idea, right? Like, where, where does this, where, what do I have to do from the Old Testament versus the New Testament? And some of the law of the Old Testament was carried into the New, but a lot of it wasn't. And kind of figuring out what that looks like is valuable, right? Like, for instance, like sexual immorality is still sexually immoral. Sin is still sin in the New Testament, right? Uh, is it okay to drink alcohol is usually a big one. You'll have churches that forbid it, like outright. We're not one of those churches, right? Uh, Christians are allowed to drink alcohol, but as personal preference, some people might not, and it might not be right for them, as we'll find out, which is weird. Uh, or, or another question is, do we tithe? Is it right for believers, or should believers be required, rather, to give 10% to the church, right? Some people adhere to that. Some people in our church adhere to that and believe that's what they need to do, and, and I mean, Ben and, and I have taught, you know, New Testament giving is one of generosity, right, that we're not obligated to a particular number, but what we're obligated to is that we give generously, sacrificially, and, and joyfully is what we're supposed to do. So, so in terms of some of that stuff, that's what we see. Let's see. Uh, in terms of doctrine, let's see. I just, like, my screen just went blank. I don't know what happened here. I do have another tablet, fortunately, all set to go if, if I need it, but uh, it's loading. In terms of doctrine, yeah, this one is your tablet. I don't know why. I, use her, I steal hers from her on Sundays because mine usually acts up funny. Mine's older than hers. But in, in terms of doctrine, we disagree as well. Like, what time is the rapture going to happen? Is it before the tribulation, mid-trib, or post-trib? That's okay. It's not going to affect whether or not you're saved or going to heaven if we disagree on that point. Or like, how long did creation of the universe take, right? That, that's okay to disagree on. Uh, a, a common one is, what's the relationship between God's uh, foreknowledge and my free will when it comes to salvation? Right, that's like a huge one that's baffled the church for a long time. And Ben Preston and I, Ben the previous pastor, we disagreed on that point. It actually came up in a Bible study the first time we hung out. We're like, oh, okay, oh, so you're on, all right. And like, but it didn't bother us that we disagreed on that because we realized that we would be doing exactly the same thing, right? We'd still be proclaiming Jesus. People would still encounter Jesus and be experiencing salvation. And him and I would just disagree as far as the background mechanism by which that was happening. So it's like, that doesn't matter. And then when we get to heaven, we'll figure out who was right. And that's fine, right? Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, we don't need to have a church split over this. So, so let's take a look at Romans, and, and Paul talks about some particular areas that probably aren't matters of disagreement for you, but let's take the principles out of this passage as far as how do we handle disagreement. So, so Romans 14, page 683, this is what he says, uh, accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. So he's referring to believers that are weak in faith as those who were still practicing particular Old Testament law that they didn't have to anymore, they were freed from, but that we should accept them anyway. Like, all right, you, you can restrict yourself as far as what food you want to eat, and that's okay. Like, that's, that's fine, that's what he's saying. So let's, let, let's accept them. Don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong, so we don't have to get into arguments about it. Verse 2. For instance, if one person believes it's all right to eat anything, that's the camp that I'm in, just so you know, Paul was also in that camp, but another believer is, has a sensitive conscience and will eat only vegetables. Verse three, those who feel free to eat anything, so now it's giving instruction, so this was perhaps a gray area where they disagreed as far as practice, but the Bible is very clear as to how we treat one another when we do disagree. So, let me put it this way. None of us should disagree with how we handle disagreement, if that makes sense, okay? Like, the Bible's 100% clear on this. Verse 3, so those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain to, uh, foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. So this is the idea. Uh, another translation says, don't despise or don't treat with contempt the person that has, right, the stricter guideline. Right? Don't be like, oh, man, that person's such a wet blanket. They ruin all my fun. 
Whenever they come over my house, I can't have alcohol because it offends them, right? Like, no, 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 don't do that, right? Love that person. And, and if, if there's the person who refuses to eat certain foods, they should not judge the one who is free to because the Bible has clearly given them liberty in Christ to do those things, right? So it's not like I'm going to judge the way you practice differently than me and require somehow that you do the same as I do. No, no, no. Like, that's what he's saying. Like, the way we treat one another is important. Let's look at verse 4. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another. Now he's bringing up a separate issue, right? How do we celebrate holidays? Do we, do we have to celebrate certain uh, Old Testament religious holidays? Or should we practice on the Sabbath for gathering? Saturday is the Sabbath. Or should we gather on Sunday, the Lord's Day? Right? Okay, that's where the disagreement was, okay? And he says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another. Well, others think every day is alike. Like, God made every day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Every day I'll treat as holy before the Lord, right? So, two different camps on that. And this is a really interesting idea. He says, you should each be fully convinced, that whichever day you choose is acceptable. So this is kind of interesting, is like, be fully persuaded of what you believe, even though there's disagreement. We know that both can't be true, right? That there's contradiction between those two practices, but the Bible says that in this area where it's a gray area, right, where it's not a matter of sin, it's not a matter of false doctrine or teaching, that let each person be fully convinced, Like, practice your life before the Lord for his glory is what the idea is, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's interesting. Verse 6, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord, and whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. All right, just so you know, like, if you forget to pray before your meal, you're not, like, going to die or get sick, all right? Like, that's, that's not a sin. Like, we should be thankful to God for his provision for us, but just so you're aware. Uh, but that's, that's a verse that talks about it anyways as to why we might pray before we eat. Um, verse 7, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. We can't just think like, I'm going to do whatever I want, and I don't care what anyone else thinks. That there's an interdependency here. There's community with one another. So I can't just like trample other people with my beliefs or my judgment, right? Or the way that I practice that it's offending and harming them, right? I can't just do that. We are interconnected. We're not an island to ourselves. Verse eight, uh, sorry, verse seven. No, I was, I was verse eight. I've got them jumping back and forth now. Stay on your toes, guys. Verse eight. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord, right? So if you're celebrating every day is unto the Lord, you're doing it for who? The Lord, not yourself and your own preference, right? If you're restricting the food you eat, you're not doing it for your own sake, right? Like, I, I'm so special. I do it this way for me. No, no, no. You're doing it as unto the Lord, right? He is the one that we do it for. Uh, verse 9, for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So in terms of our practice, where we disagree, it's not about me doing it my way. It's about all of us aiming to please the Lord, right? We call him Lord because he's one that deserves to be obeyed, right? We call him Lord because he's the one that we're aiming to please with our lives, the one that we're trying to to give glory to in the way that we live our lives because he's given all of his for our sake to be saved, right? So so that's, that's the idea. Is that, like, it's not just like uh, all of us kind of running around with our own egos and like, I'm going to do it my way. No, no, no. We're all trying to do it the Lord's way. And we just might disagree on some of that. So verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Here's a big idea. Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say... As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So it's not a matter of, right, me being able to live my life my way and say, you can't judge me. 
right? In some sense, I'm not going to be measured by your standard. But likewise, I'm not going to be measured by my standard, right? We are all going to go before the Lord to give an account for our lives. So it's not like I can just be like, you know, trampling people and I don't care what you think and living my life in sin, right? And just say, oh, no, only God can judge me. Like saying that phrase, if I'm living in sin before God, like that's not a wise thing to say. Like that, that's foolishness, right? That we are, we should recognize that we are accountable to him as our Lord. And, and it's by his standard, not mine and not someone else's, to which I will be held accountable, right? So, so that's why I got to be, right, careful. It's my aim to please him. And in terms of, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about this next week, but in terms of instances where there is obvious sin, okay, where there is like the Bible's like 100% clear on this, there's no confusion, and there is obvious sin that we are called to not judge, right, but we are called to warn other believers, right, to, to gently restore them out of that sin situation. So some things are wrong, and no personal opinion or cultural opinion will end up changing that whether or not it's right, right? That, that God's opinion is not going to suddenly shift on those things and where he has made his opinion clear, like our response is to not twist it, not to try to make it more convenient for ourselves, but to obey him because he's Lord, right? So, so for instance, if I think, you know, I don't, if, if I had the thought, I don't think God really cares about my pride. Like I think self-righteousness is fine. Like I would be wrong. The Bible is very clear on that point. Or if I thought, you know, like, I think it's okay if I watch pornography, my wife says it's cool or whatever, I think it's something I can do. Like, no, 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 the Bible's very clear on that point. Like, that's just sin. That's not a matter of personal preference. That's just wrong, okay? Or, or someone might think, I don't think Jesus really meant it when he said you can't serve God in money. I'm gonna live my life for me and just seeking money, pursuing money, and I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm just gonna live according to greed. Like, that's not true. Like, that's not, that's not one of these areas that Paul is talking about where it would be a matter of personal preference. The Bible is abundantly clear on those points. Let's see, verse 13, Paul keeps going. So, so in these areas where practice can differ, he says this, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. So this brings up a very valid point that my practice, my preference does not take priority over love of other believers, okay? That I don't get to do things my way to the point where it's causing harm to other believers, right? Yes, we are called to liberty. Yes, we are free in Jesus, but that freedom is less important than serving God and loving others, is the idea, okay? So, uh, so yeah, uh, we shouldn't use our liberty to abuse other people. That wouldn't be right. Verse 14, I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. So Paul makes his opinion clear there. He's like, you can go and eat anything you want, really. I mean, there's still, gluttony still is a thing, just so you're aware. But, 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 but he's saying, like, there's not, like, a particular food that will make you unholy somehow, all right? He says, but if someone believes it is wrong, check this out, then for that person it is wrong. So that's like such a weird idea that they could do something that biblically isn't wrong, but because of their own personal conscience and belief that it is wrong, for them, God says it is, in fact, wrong. Right, like, so for instance, like, I celebrate the fact that Christians have the liberty to drink alcohol, but I myself do not drink alcohol. I mean, it's just a matter of personal conscience. And for me, it might even be to the point of it being a sin if I did, even though it's not a sin in general. So it's kind of like a weird idea. It's, it's, I would be betraying my own conscience, right? Even though it's an area that God is not offended by, the fact that I would intentionally be going against what I thought was wrong, that attitude, that rebellious behavior, that's the thing that would be wrong. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, so the way it says this in James 4, 17, I've got that up on the screen. It says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. 
right? So we should still yield to our conscience in these matters. But the Bible still does point out that, uh, it, I don't have it on the screen, but in 1 John 3, it talks about the fact that uh, our conscience does not reign supreme, that sometimes I might feel overly condemned for something to which God has forgiven me, right? That the Holy Spirit in us is the one that's actually right all the time. So y- your conscience isn't always going to be right, okay? And that we can trust God when he has fully forgiven us and that we should yield to God. I might not feel guilty about doing something that the Bible calls a sin, but I still have to yield to what God's standard is, right? So it's my conscience isn't the only thing that's at play here. But in the areas when I know the right thing to do and fail to do it for me, it is sin. So what I would encourage is that don't base your morality on what you observe in other people, other believers, okay? Uh, so, so if there was, for instance, yeah, and I, like if, if I was a pastor that did drink alcohol, and for you it was a stumbling stone, like it's something that would mess you up, something that you have no ability to drink in moderation, right? You can't just be like, well, Pastor Brian, he does it, so I'm going to go like, I'm going to get hammered this weekend. Like, that doesn't somehow justify what you're doing, okay? So there may be other believers that are able to do things that you yourself are not able to practice, okay? So don't base your morality or your standard on other people. Or there just might be flat out other believers that are in sin, right? Someone might just actually be doing wrong and you don't want to base what's right upon what they are doing, okay? So so it's not like a metric of like, well, you know, I'm better than that person or that person's allowed to do that, so I guess I can do that. It's, It's a matter of still that internal, if I know it's a sin for me, it's a sin for me is the idea. Verse 15, If another believer, so we're back in Romans, just so you know. If another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. So don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. So just because I might have liberty to do certain things, if I know it's an area of personal preference or some temptation for another believer doesn't allow me to do that thing when I'm around them, okay? So, like, if someone is a vegetarian, I'm not going to be, like, like, eating meat in front of them when I invite them over my house. Like, that would be rude. I mean, if, they, if they're, like, no, it doesn't really bother me, like, then okay, then I know where the line is and I could eat meat, right? So, so just so you're aware, but we don't do it in a way uh, that's going to harm the other believer. The priority is love. In, in 1 Corinthians 8, I've got this verse up on the screen, which Uh, 1 Corinthians 8 is a chapter that talks about similar things to Romans 14. So if you wanted to read that on your own time, you could. Uh, But it it goes even further. It says this, uh, and when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So it's not only something that's unloving, it's I'm sinning against them, and I'm not only just sinning against them, it says I'm sinning against Christ. Right, like it said in Romans, it's, I'm, I'm harming someone for whom Christ died, right? That he considered them worth dying for. So, so this is the idea. Serving and loving others takes priority over my personal preference and freedom, all right? I know that's like completely like countercultural America, like I can do what I want. Like, no, no, no. Like we as believers, we uh, surrender sometimes the rights and the freedoms we have for the sake of loving others. Is the idea. So, uh, so let's see. Let's, let's keep going. Verse 16. I'm, a, I'm, I'm doing okay for time, I think. Okay. Whew. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good, right? And the way that you're handling yourself, you're not doing it in a way that's harming other people. You're not going to be judged for it, right? That, that that's the way it ends up working. So, uh, in verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink. All right? Like, our being a part of God's kingdom is not about how well I can celebrate certain holidays, right? It's not about how well I can eat certain foods or not eat certain foods. That's not how we enter into God's kingdom. We enter into God's kingdom through Jesus, right, who fulfilled all of the law for us and made it so that we could be forgiven. But this is what the Bible says the kingdom of God is about. It says, but it's a matter of living a life of goodness, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
I'll actually go as far as to say uh, I don't like the New Living Translation use of the word goodness only because of our cultural understanding of the word goodness. Uh, other translations use the word righteousness here. And I just feel like that has a little bit more weight to it for us to recognize like, oh, like, I don't know, I try to be good. Like, no, 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 no. Like, the kingdom of God is about righteousness, holiness before God, because he has made us holy. All right, so that's, that's what that's talking about. But, but it made this point. It says the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink. Jesus said this in, in Mark 7. I don't have it on the screen. He says, can't you see that the food you put into your body does not defile you? It's not what you're eating that makes you unholy. It's not what goes into the body that makes you unholy. This is what he said in verse 20 in, in Mark 7. He says, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Right? So the things that would make us unrighteous are the things that are already on the inside of us in our sin nature. That's what we have to be concerned about. Right? Unfortunately, Jesus forgives us of all of those things, and then throughout the rest of our lives, the Holy Spirit's making us more and more like him. So those things that do come out of our heart, we can repent of and be clean before God. So that's what the, the kingdom of God is about. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness before God, peace with one another, and then having joy right, with the Holy Spirit, the fact that God dwells and lives with us as believers for the rest of our lives, and then even after we die, we get to still belong to the Lord. So it's awesome stuff. Let's see, before my last verse, let's have the worship team come up. Let those guys get set up. And verse 18 and 19 in Romans, uh, it says this. If you serve Christ, so actually, let me just point out the word serve there, right? Once again, it's not about our own egos and us doing our own thing. It's about us serving Christ. So if you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. Verse 19, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up, right? So even in the instance with, with Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, after they had that sharp disagreement, they still were able to go and encourage other churches, other churches were built up. And in the way that we live our lives, when we have a disagreement amongst each other, that's okay, but what we should aim for is harmony, is, is unity together on the things that matter most when it comes to the gospel, right, that will still work together to share the love that God has for the world with the world, right? And that we could then build one another up, that it's not a matter of like, well, I don't like that person because they're, you know, particular theological doctrine, like, no, 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 I'm going to go and encourage that person and equip them in the way that God's called them to be able to do what they've been called to do, right? So that's the idea. So you might not care about eating and holidays, but wherever the Bible has been unclear, all right, the things that maybe you do find disagreements with other believers on, right, the way we handle it, the Bible is clear about, right? That we are to, right, be kind to one another, not judging one another, not despising one another, right? And that we are to love one another and put that as the priority over our personal preference, so, so let's just pray real quick. I think I did all right for time. All right, here we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have brought your church together, that the church is something that you've established as your primary plan to which the world would be reached with the gospel. We thank you, God, that you have made a people of whom there were no people, that we come from a variety of backgrounds and opinions and families and beliefs, but Lord, we have all come to your cross and yielded to you, submitted our lives to you, and we follow you as disciples. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us, that you continue to offer us, and where we've failed in loving our brothers and sisters, I ask that you would forgive us now. Help us as believers to demonstrate unity in the things that matter most and in these secondary issues that we would not bicker and fight and bring harm to one another. Lord, we ask that you would just uh, allow us to focus on the things that matter most in proclaiming your love to our community. Help us to be a light to this world. And Lord, I thank you that even where we have failed, your mercy is there for us, your forgiveness is there for us, and you can even turn those situations for your glory and your good. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.